Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you organifi is a line of organic superfood blends that offer plant-based nutrition made with high quality ingredients each organifi blend is science-backed to craft the most effective doses with the ingredients that are organic and free of fillers and contain less than three grams of sugar per serving like organifi green juice with essential superfoods and a clinical dose of ashwagandha. It helps reduce stress and support healthy cortisol levels. Or Organifi Red Juice, a superfood punch that increases energy without caffeine and only 2 grams of sugar. Each Organifi blend is easy to use simply by mixing it with water or your favorite beverage while on the go, and they don't compromise quality for taste. Organifi takes pride in offering the best-tasting superfood products on the market at a price that works out to less than $3 a day. You can experience Organifi's high-quality superfoods without breaking the bank. Go to Organifi.com slash genius and use the code genius for 20% off your order. That's Organifi.com forward slash genius. Use code genius to get 20% off any item. Remember, www.organifi.com slash genius. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius Podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations uh, to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems uh, because I've seen them explode recently after the, uh, you know, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously. Give us a thumbs up. And check in the description for Buy Me a Coffee. It's about 5 bucks. If you could buy me a coffee, I'd really appreciate it. It would help keep the channel going, and I love coffee. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have Amber Walker. She's the owner of Origin Wellness, based out of Denver, Colorado. She's a physical therapist, passionate about public health and chronic illness. She was once, it looks like, completely sidelined by uh, health conditions herself. So I'm going to hear about that and what her current techniques are for helping people with various issues. So, Amber, thanks for coming. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here. I appreciate this. Oh, no problem. Tell me a bit about your, your background and, you know, if you're okay with it, a bit about your health journey. Sure, absolutely. Well... I think many practitioners can relate to becoming passionate about a field that they've had personal experience in, and that was certainly the case for me. But uh, I originally was a doctor of physical therapy, focusing more on orthopedics and hands-on care with patients, and eventually became more curious and passionate about working with chronic illness, and eventually developed some additional resources for myself in pursuits and training in things like functional medicine and nutrition as I evolved through my own health journey. But I definitely had a several decade history of chronic symptoms that didn't add up, a lot of kind of mysterious things that were going on that didn't really make sense and went through a lot of different doctors and practitioners and opinions trying to get to the bottom of it. But to make a long story short, essentially, I had, a, I don't know, 16 or 20 
different labels at, at one point, different types of conditions going on, you know, everything from, say, Hashimoto's to monoclonal mast cell activation syndrome to hereditary angioedema, Lyme disease, Jesus. Sears for mold exposure, all sorts of things. And I really started to develop this resume, uh, not the kind of resume that I wanted, of course, uh, to more and more conditions piling up, you know, SIBO, I don't know, there was a whole list. And eventually I was fortunately able to get to the bottom of some of the root issues for all the inflammation in my system and was able to find healing. So that's what I'm passionate about now is really just spreading a message of hope for people who have chronic conditions that with the right approach, healing and reversal of many, if not all of these symptoms is truly possible. You know, I think especially in the patient community that I work in, we're talking about patients who have mast cell activation syndrome and a type of dysautonomia called POTS and a hypermobility spectrum disorder called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. There's a lot of discouragement and hopelessness, and there's a lot of gaslighting that occurs as well. Within the medical system, there's a lot of medical trauma that happens. And so really hoping to shift that dialogue and shift that perspective for those patients and to show them that it is possible to heal and to get to the bottom of that and to get to those root issues and to, at the end of the day, hopefully come out healthier than before, like myself. So is there um, a course a course of work that um, most of the people you interact with go through? Or, I mean, how individualized is it? And how many con- different conditions do you observe that you've been able to help? Well, yeah, typically a couple of things that I work on, I guess, in terms of sharing information with others. I do work one-on-one with patients, and it's really customized to the individual in terms of what that looks like. I also try to educate through writing, and I, I really enjoy writing. So I put a couple of books out there. The first one was about mast cell activation syndrome, and then the second one was about the trifecta of those three conditions I just mentioned, MCAS, POTS, and EDS are the acronyms for those conditions. Uh, but I'm also passionate about sharing education through courses and different events. But in terms of the one-on-one care, yeah, that typically is um, something that's really customized. Some of my clients come in and they have – one or two categories of symptoms that are nagging them. Other clients come in and they have that resume like I had of 15 or 20 conditions and diseases and several decades of health issues. So there's really kind of a large spectrum in terms of what it looks like day to day. Tell me a bit about mast cell activation. I haven't really heard much about it. What's involved? Mast cell activation syndrome is a newer term. I'm just going to start calling it MCAS because it's kind of a mouthful when we talk about it. But MCAS is essentially a condition where certain immunological cells in our body are hypersensitive to our environment and they're releasing these chemical mediators inappropriately at times where they probably shouldn't be. So these are things like histamine. Many people have heard of histamine and are familiar with histamine, but there's hundreds of these different chemical mediators that the cells release. And this can trigger a whole host system-wide throughout the entire body. So this is a part of our immune response that we want functioning if we have, an, say, a foreign invader, bacterial infection, virus, a parasite, for example, exposure to something like that. We want the mast cell to be there as that first defense line to help. But what happens in these patients who have this condition is we have sort of this chronic activation of these cells, and these patients often become more and more ill, more and more sensitive to things like foods and supplements and medications and environmental factors, chemicals. So it becomes this sort of perfect storm of inflammation for many of these patients, and it can be extremely isolating and debilitating if those root issues don't get uncovered. Often, and when it comes to the root issues with mast cell activation syndrome, or what I see most often in my clinical practice is typically some type of toxic burden, some type of toxic exposure, sluggish detox and methylation pathways, those sorts of things often come into play. So one of the biggest things I tend to see when patients have this unusual mast cell reactivity in their system is that They've had some type of exposure to mold in a water-damaged building at some point in their life that has built up some toxins in the system that are triggering this hypersensitivity with these mast cells. Uh, How does this tie into, or does it at all tie into POTS and EDS, or is it totally separate? I do believe it's very connected in terms of the mold piece, at least. Now, we know there's a lot of overlap between these mast cell-type flares of symptoms and flares of POTS as well as connective tissue and orthopedic flares that we see with EDS. Now, with treatment of some of the root issues, if we look at kind of that natural and functional medicine lens and getting in there and helping the body remove toxins, supporting gut health, hormones, adrenals, et cetera, we tend to see reversal of symptoms of all three of these conditions. Now, 
there's a spectrum to that, you know, and, and certainly I see when, for example, when people start to bind and remove mold from their system, if they go about it the right way, which is very slowly and gently with a very specific approach, then typically symptoms of POTS will resolve fairly rapidly is the trend I tend to see clinically on that. The mast cell piece takes a little bit longer to calm down, but I also tend to see that pattern resolve when we address mold for the mast cells. And then also see that the severity of inflammation with EDS tends to calm down as well. You know, certainly not when somebody has EDS, there's connective tissue properties that are abnormal. So I do believe that toxins influence some of those genetic pathways and influence obviously the inflammation at the tissue level. So I would say we see a reduction in the, the intensity or severity of all three conditions when we start to address these root issues and they are all strongly interconnected, so to speak. Um, can you talk a little bit about POTS then? What is it? I think it's positional orthostatic. Yeah, POTS uh, stands for postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And this is a type of autonomic nervous system dysregulation issue where we see a rise in heart rate that's pretty substantial with positional changes. So when patients go from lying to upright, for example, we'll see a huge spike in the heart rate but it's not typically an orthostatic issue with the blood pressure. So it's not that the blood pressure is dropping. And so the heart rate's compensating. It's usually independent of that. And there's different types of POTS, but essentially this can be really debilitating for people living with this sometimes means inability to tolerate the upright position altogether, very difficult to get around. So this is a condition that is accompanied by many other symptoms. It's not just the heart rate issue, but we see a lot of gut issues and a lot of other systemic things going on when patients have POTS too. Well, why would people have this? What would cause it? Well, if we come back to my kind of observations with the toxic burden, if reducing toxic burden can reverse POTS symptoms in many patients, there has to be a connection there. <laughs> I do believe there is, there is a bigger link now. A lot of the conventional approach to POTS when we look at the mainstream world is more focused on hydrating and doing tons of fluid, tons of salt, compression stockings, some of these things that are often, in my humble opinion, a bit of a band-aid approach. And they can help. They can help somebody function a little bit better. But at the end of the day, I think it's so important to get to these root issues and what's stemming inflammation and what's potentially burdening the system and triggering this autonomic nervous system dysregulation. I also see another correlation with the head and the neck and the cervical spine. And for some people, that is a big part of what's going on with their POTS. So it's not just a toxic burden, but I do think that patients who have some instability in their upper levels of cervical spine, especially C1, C2, we tend to see a huge association with that and their symptoms of dysautonomia. And so addressing the head and neck, really, really important. You know, a lot of patients who have that EDS or that Ehlers-Danlos syndrome do have instability in the neck. And so there's another link there between POTS and EDS. But I do think it is really important that a comprehensive plan addresses what's going on with the autonomic nervous system, what's going on with the head and neck, and what's going on with toxins when it comes to all three of these conditions, as well as addressing mold, <laughs> for that matter. Well, how is someone supposed to know if they were exposed to mold if they didn't have an acute problem when it happened? How would they That's look? That's a great question. Get That's to think a about great it. question. Yeah. There's a lot of testing out there in terms of determining if a building may be moldy and if a human body might be moldy. In terms of the human body's angle of things, there are a couple of schools of kind of testing and treatment. There's a Shoemaker protocol, which Dr. Shoemaker is kind of their leading pioneer in this field in terms of having discovered that mold can impact human health. And then there's sort of a more naturopathic approach to testing for and treating mold, and both have their pros and cons. But essentially, there are certain blood markers that tend to be elevated when somebody has this con condition of Sears, which is chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which is typically caused by the biotoxins that come from mold. So blood markers can help. There are urine tests where you can actually measure mycotoxins in the urine. And there are studies out there that show differences between patients who are sick from mold versus healthy controls. For example, a 2019 study was looking at some urinary mycotoxins, and they found that the levels of these mold toxins in the urine were about 11 times more concentrated in individuals who are sick from mold than individuals who are not. So it appears we can measure these metabolites in the urine and make some assumptions based on that. There are other types of testing, all sorts of things out there. There's even, you know, brain spec scans that show patterns when people have had mold exposure. There's a visual test you can do to look at whether biotoxins have impacted the optic nerve to try to get a little bit of insight there. The allergy testing isn't as helpful, you know, in terms of antibody responses to mold 
because that's looking at allergies. That's not looking at toxicity. So we're really trying to figure out if patients have been exposed in the past and if their body's been able to handle those mold toxins and get them out of the system properly. And one of the things that's unique about mold is that about 25 to 35, let's say, percent of patients or humans, I should say, have a genetic issue in a pathway called HLA-DR where they're actually unable to tag mycotoxins as harmful and get them out of the body. And so that's why you can have a whole bunch of people in the same office building and only a few of them might be sick from mold if they're exposed. Or that's why you can have a whole family in a house, but maybe not everybody has symptoms. That's where it gets a little tricky and confusing is because certain people have these genetic predispositions to where they can't remove those mycotoxins. They, instead, they build up, they congregate in the fatty tissue of the body, and they create symptoms. Now, the other thing with mold is you can't just go by symptoms because people often assume, oh, well, you know, I, I don't have respiratory symptoms or I don't have allergies, so therefore I mustn't be sick from mold. Well, mold can cause symptoms all over the human body, and they're not always manifesting that way. So chronic fatigue, brain fog, headaches, there's gut issues, skin issues. There's a whole bunch of other things that can occur when somebody has the toxicity of mold building up. So we can't just go by symptoms alone. It is helpful to have some laboratory tests. And the other thing that's really important is to make sure that somebody's living in a healthy home or a healthy building when we know that a vast majority of homes in the U.S. are going to have a mold problem at some point in their lives. So it's also helpful to work with a company who really knows what they're doing when it comes to testing, because a lot of these companies just do air samples and they don't really do a thorough job at determining if there is any type of exposure occurring. So um, what are some of the biomarkers that, that say whether someone's had mold toxicity or not? Uh, in terms of the blood biomarkers, is that what you're looking for? Yeah, blood biomarkers and other, yes. Uh, blood yeah. and urine, actually. Blood and urine. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole list. When it comes to, you know, looking at what the Shoemaker Protocol is typically interested in. We're looking at things like C4A, TGF beta 1, MMP9, leptin is a marker that is often evaluated for the Shoemaker protocol in terms of if that person, if we're suspecting they might have Sears. Those are all things that are typically high in patients who have Sears. And then so they, they, I'm, I'm talking about from a customer's point of view that's going to get their blood work. It doesn't sound like any of these are normally tested when you get your blood work done. Oh, yeah, so what yeah. are these in layman's terms, and how do you even know to get this stuff tested? <laughs> sure, yeah. This is where you have to really work with a practitioner. I don't, I don't believe that the consumer can just go to their, their doctor, and you know, I think it's helpful to work with somebody who's mold savvy. So first of all, you can go to different practitioner sites, Dr. Neil Nathan, Dr. Jill Krista. They've both written excellent books on the topics and have practitioner listings. Dr. Shoemaker, I believe, has a practitioner listing on his website where you can find somebody who can guide you into the testing. It really depends if you want to do, you know, Shoemaker protocol approach or not, which is going to be more of these blood work. You know, the, there's other things that are often low also, different inflammatory markers, markers of cytokines. Leptin is a, a marker, gives us some information about uh, feeling of fullness and those sorts of things. So these, all these different markers have different functions and roles in the body. And I, I don't know that I'll go through each one and I kind of tease out that piece because I think a practitioner who really knows what they're doing is going to be able to help with interpret, you know, ordering and interpreting that. But you can certainly gain some information looking at other things, other patterns, um, other blood markers, liver enzymes, kidney markers, like even glutathione. Um, we look at Sometimes CBC, white blood cell count, there's all sorts of things that can be ordered. So, you know, it's not just a simple have this, this one test. And it's really putting all these patterns together because there is no definitive single marker that says, yes, you have Sears or no, you do not. So it's, it can be sort of a clinical diagnosis. You know, typically we're looking at, and the way I practice or the way op I operate, I follow more of the naturopathic approach to this. So I'm looking more at the visual contrast sensitivity test, which can be found online at vcstest.com is one of the the ways you can take that test. It's a kind of a screening tool. It's not diagnostic, but at least helps us decide if, you know, about 80% of the time, if that test is positive, there's been a mycotoxin issue in that person's body. Then I typically will use some urinary labs and that are going to evaluate for anywhere from five to 10 different categories of mycotoxins in the urine. And then we kind of go from there. So I think that's it really depends, you know, which type of practitioner you're working with. What you're know, but but, but how, how are people supposed to even identify what's going on with all these acronyms? It just seems like it's just a bunch of gobbledygook. Like, how do people present 
to even have a hint that, oh, I should look for a protection practitioner that may help with mold or this or that or the other. Like, what are some of the leading indicators? You mean like the symptoms that they have in terms of? Yeah, like, because people versus... don't know acronyms. They just know symptoms. So how would they even know that any of this applies to them? Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's a whole different, that's a whole different XYZ. question. <laughs> I can spout out off all the tests if you want that. You know, in terms of patients kind of looking at this and going, do I think mold could be a factor, you know, in my health or not? There's symptom questionnaires you can also do. There's some screening questionnaires. That Dr. Jill Krista has a wonderful questionnaire in her book that helps. But in general, if, if I'm just sharing some of the more common symptoms that I tend to see when patients are sick from mold, they're more typically going to be uh, severe fatigue and headaches, a lot of brain fog, just difficulty concentrating, difficulty with memory. Sometimes we see the difficulty with breathing and allergy symptoms. Sometimes we don't. A lot of times these patients have neurological symptoms, numbness and tingling, lots of muscle and joint pain. We tend to see lots of Dizziness, ringing of the ears is very, very common. Insomnia, very, very common. A lot of these patients have sensory sensitivities, OCD tendencies, mood swings, food cravings, a lot of gut things, chemical sensitivities. We tend to see a lot of pelvic pain and urinary symptoms come up a lot in these patients as well. Certainly some neurocognitive symptoms, anxiety and depression is very, very common. A lot of these patients have issues with thirst and urination, and that has to do with some of those blood markers. But essentially, the pathway is what happens with mold is we can see a shift in that. Uh, we tend to see sinus issues, of course, and body temperature dysregulation is another common one. Sometimes we see weird things as well, like I guess weird category would be the tendency to get a lot of electric shocks it can be really common based on some different imbalances that happen on a, a chemical level. Organifi is a line of organic superfood blends that offer plant-based nutrition made with high-quality ingredients. Each Organifi blend is science-backed to craft the most effective doses with the ingredients that are organic and free of fillers and contain less than 3 grams of sugar per serving, like Organifi green juice with essential superfoods and a clinical dose of ashwagandha. It helps reduce stress and support healthy cortisol levels. Or Organifi red juice, a superfood punch that increases energy without caffeine and only 2 grams of sugar. Each Organifi blend is easy to use simply by mixing it with water or your favorite beverage while on the go and they don't compromise quality for taste. Organifi takes pride in offering the best tasting superfood products on the market at a price that works out to less than $3 a day. You can experience Organifi's high quality superfoods without breaking the bank. Go to Organifi.com genius and use the code genius for 20% off your order. That's Organifi.com forward slash genius. Use code genius to get 20% off any item. Remember, www.organifi.com slash genius. Electric shocks or like do they, um, what about electronic devices malfunctioning more often than the person has? These, yeah, that is another kind of category that a lot of patients do report where they have sensitivity to EMFs or those electric and magnetic fields. Sometimes, sure, devices can go haywire around them for some of those patients, but there's certainly some energetic things that seem to be occurring there. And even you know, on a, a more severe end of the spectrum, some of these patients will have seizures or some other more serious medical concerns going on that bring them to the emergency room. No, I say it because myself and my older daughter, for some reason, it's kind of a, a family joke that we destroy electronic devices much faster than anyone else my wife has ever seen. So that's why I came to mind for a second. <laughs> yeah, that can certainly be a part of the puzzle. I have seen that come up quite a lot for people. Yeah, I don't think the other symptoms are applied, but you know, that was an interesting one. So people will come to you with these kind of symptoms and then, uh, you know, mold comes to mind and you do this testing. I don't know. I, I guess with these mycotoxins, would, would any kind of mushrooms help, actually? I mean, if it's, maybe it's a weird thing, you know, have even more fungi in you. But uh, are there any remedies in terms of food I mean, or diets uh, that include, let's say, different types of mushrooms, turkey tail, reishi, et cetera? Or is that not even on the radar? Or does that not work for these things? Yeah, that's a really great question. So... Typically, in terms of addressing this for a season of treatment, many of the experts recommend people do avoid any type of moldy foods, foods that might have more contamination. That includes the mushroom category. Now, with I say that with a grain of take that with a grain of salt because it's not a hard no, and it really depends on the person. And we know that there's a lot of benefits to adaptogens, and some of these different types of mushrooms have tremendous healing benefits. So. 
it, that is a customized decision in my world, but some practitioners say a hard no for the mushroom medicine while we're addressing mold. There are a lot of other food sources that are often contaminated with mycotoxins. We see a lot come up in like the, many of our grains, corn, wheat, when they do the testing, there's pretty high levels of toxins and things like peanut butter, peanuts, and, and many other foods. So there's generally a low mold diet that's encouraged for patients who are following the naturopathic approach to addressing mold for a season, because we don't want to be bringing more in as we're trying to bind and remove that stuff. So it's, it's really kind of a season of reducing the overall load. I've heard that, uh, you know, everyone talks about our microbiome. I've heard one or two scientists talk about the microbiome, <laughs> but what if mold, mold toxicity is an expression of like a, a dysbiosis in your microbiome? And maybe there would be a probiotic that would be mushrooms, you know, different kinds of stuff that you could take to restore the balance. I don't know if there's any, you know, I don't, I've never heard of anyone getting their microbiome sequenced. And I don't know if people in general have a predominance of certain types of fungi in them that maybe get displaced. Like C. difficile would displace normal healthy gut bacteria and mess someone up. So I just wonder, it just comes to mind, I wonder if this, this is a factor that happens. I love that question. I have so many thoughts <laughs> on different angles. We see C. diff come up a lot in patients who are moldy. So there's, there seems to be these sort of symbiotic uh, relationships with bacterial and fungal layers there. We know there's biofilm in the nasal sinuses, and we know that we see colonies of mycotoxins in those areas. So yeah, I, I completely agree to some extent that, there's, that, that that's a possibility, and that's part of what's going on with these patients. However, using mold to treat mold doesn't always seem to work. What, what tends to happen in these patients is that there's a toxicity that develops where we actually use binders. We bring in binders to help remove the mycotoxins from the system, and that's when patients start to feel better and to heal. So that seems to be the best approach. Now, there is a fungal-based probiotic called Saccharomyces boulardii, which is sometimes used as a loose binder for mold. However, many patients feel worse when they're on it. So it's re really, there's a lot of, you know, customized decisions that have to happen here with these patients in terms of some of these things, whether or not mushrooms stay in the picture or not. But I have not found that that alone, using something like that alone is enough to provide healing. So generally we have to go in very gently with the right types of binders done in the right way. And I think where a lot of, a lot of practitioners um, maybe rush this process a little too much is they might just start people on a binder right away for mold. But if the detox pathways aren't ready for that, if things aren't open, then people can actually have this enterohepatic recirculation of toxins where they feel worse. And so this really has to be done with finesse. And it's not just something I feel you can kind of biohack your way through. I think you really do need to work with a practitioner on this stuff. Well, I mean, you can't help everyone in the world. What do people look for? How would they even know the name of a, of a practitioner that would care about this, know about this, and be able to help? What are they called, if anything? Well, I think... If you start looking into the functional medicine world, you're probably going to find practitioners who are pretty well-versed in this. I'd say Sears for mold exposure is fairly, fairly common in terms of the education in the functional medicine world and the resources out there. But if you want to be more specific, I alluded to a couple of websites before, you know, Dr. Jill Krista, Dr. Neil Nathan, some of our my heroes, some of the gurus in this area, they ha have some more resources connected to them of practitioners that they feel do a good job with this. So that's something you could certainly search and look for in your area. But I'd say most people with sort of a more naturopathic functional medicine approach are going to have mold on their radar. So you could certainly use that as a starting point and then ask for their questions. Ask if they work with patients who have SEERS, which is that chronic inflammatory response syndrome, CIRS. You can certainly do a search with those terms and you'll probably come up with more resources. So. Okay, but if you're looking in the functional medicine world, you're at least closer to the, you know, to the putting green, I guess, right? Exactly. Or that gets you onto the putting green. Okay. Any interesting uh, trends in people's health that you're seeing? Is there, a, a, you know, any of these conditions uh, becoming more predominant? Or, you know, what are you seeing over the past couple of years with your patients? I think a big trend I see actually comes back to frustration with the building piece because it's really hard to heal from mold if people are still living in it. So... A trend I see in the patients who, I guess, if we're not talking about success stories, but patients who are kind of plowing along but struggling a little bit or not quite there yet, usually there's still some source of exposure, whether that's home, workspace, car, uh, school, et cetera. And so it's so important to work, again, with a company who knows what they're doing with testing and to work with companies who are familiar with the Sears protocol for remediation of these buildings if there is a problem to, to find healing. So I think that's, that's the number one. It's the hardest part, the biggest hurdle with this is just avoiding exposure in the first place. And we can't really dive deep into 
the detox pathways and binding in the treatment until patients are removed from that that particular offender. So that's that's the hardest part. Um, a lot of these remediation jobs fail because people cut corners or they're not following certain guidelines or protocols, so to speak, that are going to help really get rid of the mold, you know, or they might just come in with a fogger, but they don't actually remove the source. And so there's, you know, I'm certainly no building expert, but there's a lot that patients have to learn about this as they're going through the process. It's not just how to heal their bodies, but it's also making sure that their environment is, you know, has a low enough load that they can then start to heal. I'd say on the other end of things, you know, success story wise, it's also important to remember that we don't want to have mold goggles on and not everything is just mold. So we want to be mindful of the other areas like gut health, you know, hormones, et cetera, that, that need to be addressed potentially alongside this or, you know, during this process or after can be really important. And, and working on, you know, the different detox pathways, it's, it's not just binding things in the gut, but we're working at, you know, the other ways that our system detoxifies things that can be really, really important. I also really encourage patients to go through sort of a mental, emotional, spiritual detox as part of the process. And many, most humans have some history of trauma. And so it's really important to address those angles as well. But I do have, you know, some great success stories of patients who went from being homebound, bedbound to, you know, back to work and sports and travel and all of that. So I, I do, like I said at the beginning, I do believe this message of hope that it is really possible to heal from these things when given the right tools. And I think what's really interesting right now, the other thing I've started to notice as this pandemic has been going on with COVID-19 is that there are a lot of patients who are coming in following viral exposure, having been sick with COVID, and many of them are, quote, long haulers. So they've had the, the more chronic continued effects of COVID and addressing mold is huge for them. I actually, all of my long hauler patients have tested positive with mold and have needed treatment for that and have found healing from their long hauler symptoms once we address mold. So I think there's definitely some overlap between bacterial, viral, other types of exposures and what the immune system is burdened with and what those detox pathways are burdened with in terms of the whole healing picture. I think the pandemic is, uh, has shown us that. And I think a lot of patients too have had issues from post-vaccine same thing, tend to have a high toxic burden and would benefit from looking into this angle as well. Oh, we haven't talked about uh, Ehlers Danlos syndrome. I mentioned earlier EDS. Can you briefly talk about that and what you see? Sure, yeah. So EDS is basically the name for a, it's, it's kind of an umbrella term for issues in certain genetic pathways that influence our connective tissues. And there's various categories of EDS. The type that I've been referring to is the hypermobile type of EDS, or we call it abbreviated HEDS, which is essentially connective tissue issues that are more localized to our, our skeleton in terms of our function. So a lot of these patients are going to have hypermobility or laxity in their joints. They're going to have excess movement, different movement patterns, um, especially at a young age, that, that can shift a little bit as we age. But in general, that's, that's sort of the trend. We tend to see organ issues like organ prolapse and a lot of other systemic things going on. So it's not just our orthopedic system that's involved when somebody has EDS, but it's something that has a sort of clinical diagnosis as well. There's not a genetic test at, right now for EDS, although they're, they're certainly researching that. Uh, there, there are genetic tests for the other subtypes of EDS, I should say, but for the hypermobile type, there is no genetic test at current. So more of a clinical diagnosis based off of something called the Baton scale. But essentially, these patients are typically presenting with a, a lot of widespread inflammation. So it's not just, oh, my knee hurts, but it's typically things are going on all over the body, uh, whether it's joints or connective tissue that we see these in chronic inflammatory patterns with. Uh, sometimes patients have really severe issues with subluxations and dislocations and the need for you know, advanced spinal surgeries and things like that too can occur. There's a pretty broad spectrum of what goes on with HEDS. And then in terms of um, you know, healing the gut, uh, are there any diet protocols that you see seem to work more often than others? Oh, that's a loaded question. You know, I think I'm a little controversial in my opinion on this, so I'll just throw that out there as my, <laughs> my warning. But many practitioners, when they learn about, for example, mast cell activation syndrome, they, re you know, you Google it and you find all this information on the low histamine diet. I believe that that is not the right approach for these patients. Many of these patients, when they start to get sick, they're desperate and they're like, I'll just cut out, I'll cut out total foods and food groups if it's going to help me. But what tends to happen if patients do that blindly without respecting what their body's telling them is they start to cut out more and more food groups. And then they're like, oh, I heard salicylates are bad. I'm going to try to cut out salicylate sources and oxalates and lectins and 
you name it, we can kind of go down to this pathway to where these individuals often have very restricted eating. They're down to a handful of safe foods. Many of the patients I work with have three to five foods that they can eat, and that's it. And they're very specific brands. Many of them are very sensitive to water and can only do like one brand of water. I mean, it, you, it, you get to a point where it can be very, very difficult and limiting. And so I think I would actually just say a word of caution there on following any internet trends on the, on the terms of diet for this type of, of patient, whether they have this no knowledge of mast cell activation syndrome or not. I think the same goes for a lot of patients who have been in mold, that there's food sensitivities that develop. And it's important to honor those, but also to recognize that as we get to the root issues and lower toxic burden, that generally the diet expands and, and people are able to tolerate more. And it's also important to do a lot of nervous system work and limbic system work in this process too. That's, that's a big part of it as well. So it's not just the, the functional medicine lens, but I would say a low toxin diet is what I encourage for people. So obviously the biggest things on the high histamine list, like alcohol, um, aged cheeses, cured meats, those might be helpful to avoid for other reasons in addition to the histamine piece. But in general, yeah, I would say more of a low toxin diet principle that has a lot of healing phytonutrients can be really helpful for healing, especially for mold. What were you saying about limbic work or physical work? Yeah, so uh, I think it's really important to do some work on the autonomic nervous system and how that connects to the limbic system. So a lot of these patients have a trauma history and they have some some loops that are going on in, in essence, and this can really be perpetuated by mold. For example, when you inhale a, a, you know, a mycotoxin through the nose, it travels right to the brain, olfactory nerve, and it's pretty quick that you can have a reaction to a building or a space or even an item that was in a moldy space. It doesn't even have to be walking into the building. And so the good news is that that wiring of that nervous system and the limbic system connection there with the memories that have been formed and stored in the presence of that toxin can be healed and that can be improved with the right approach. But you really have to, I, I believe, work with a practitioner. There are a lot of programs out there that can help, but trying to help the body recognize what's going on from the lens of the polyvagal theory, for example. So uh, it's not just the vagus nerve, but there's several cranial nerves that become off after we've had trauma and that can throw us into these kind of vicious cycles and these patterns with the limbic system. So if we can go in from a bottom-up approach and really give the nervous system the signals that it's safe, I think that can be really helpful. So that might look like a customized exercise program for people. Sometimes people will do Annie Hopper's program, which is called DNRS, or the Gupta program, which is another sort of top-down approach for helping heal those neural and limbic connections. But I think also I'm a big fan of any auditory therapy. So there's a program called the Safe and Sound Protocol, which is a music-based therapy that helps essentially uh, re reset the system or reshift things can be really, really powerful in patients. And that's a nice bottom-up approach that I find very helpful for patients who have, you know, molds, the trifecta I talked about of, of MCAS and POTS and EDS, as well as really anybody with a chronic inflammatory issue, I think tends to be a good candidate for that, especially individuals who find they're sensitive to things like noises and lights that could be really helpful. Well, very good. Um, Amber, what's the best way for people to reach out to you if they want help? And even or a list of the, uh, you know, we'll put the names in the show notes, but if they want to reach out or find more, keep tabs on your work, what do they do? Yeah, so you can reach me at probably the business website's the easiest way to go. It's originwellnesscolorado.com. So that is O-R-I-G-I-N, the word wellness, and then the word Colorado, all spelled out, dot com is the website there. And I also have an educational website about mast cell activation syndrome that's called mastcellsunited.com. So you're, you can also find me there. Okay. Well, very good. Amber, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. And I think you have too much knowledge. It's hard to, uh, to get a handle on all this so much, but uh, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I, I, hope, I hope that made sense and happy to clarify what didn't make sense. So. Organifi is a line of organic superfood blends that offer plant-based nutrition made with high-quality ingredients. Each Organifi blend is science-backed to craft the most effective doses with ingredients that are organic and free of fillers and contain less than 3 grams of sugar per serving, like Organifi green juice with essential superfoods and a clinical dose of ashwagandha. It helps reduce stress and support healthy cortisol levels. Or Organifi red juice, a superfood punch that increases energy without caffeine and only 2 grams of sugar. Each Organifi blend is easy to use simply by mixing it with water or your favorite beverage while on the go, and they don't compromise quality for taste. Organifi takes pride in offering the best-tasting superfood products on the market at a price that works out to less than $3 a day. You can experience Organifi's high-quality superfoods without breaking the bank. 
Go to Organifi.com slash genius and use the code genius for 20% off your order. That's Organifi.com forward slash genius. Use code genius to get 20% off any item. Remember, www.organifi.com slash genius. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.